These lectures are not designed for use as medical references to diagnose, treat, or prevent medical or mental health illnesses or trauma. If you have questions about the diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of a medical condition or mental illness, you should consult your personal physician or other mental health professional. Your lecturer is Dr. Jason M. Satterfield. Dr. Satterfield is Professor of Clinical Medicine, Director of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and Director of Behavioral Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He received his BS in Brain Sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his PhD in Clinical Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Satterfield is the author of the book, A Cognitive Behavioral Approach to the Beginning of the End of Life, and the accompanying patient workbook, Minding the Body. His clinical work has included adaptations of cognitive behavioral therapy for underserved, medically ill populations and psychological interventions for patients with serious chronic illness. Carol had always been shy. Even as a small child, she was the kind to always cling to her mother's leg. But now that she's 30 years old, she's sick and tired of being so anxious in social situations. She's tired of being overlooked. She's tired of being single. And she's tired of missing out on all the fun. Carol's determined to change. But can she? At heart, Michael, a 50-year-old man, is a thoughtful old soul who genuinely cares about people. Just don't make him angry. The problem is that nearly everything sets him off. He knows his fury is way out of proportion, but he can't seem to stop it from happening. He's bought a few self-help books, he's started going to the gym, but he wonders if he's just an angry person and if self-help is a big waste of time and money. Maria, a 70-year-old woman, is tired and worried all the time. Her husband of 45 years began showing signs of Alzheimer's dementia nearly eight years ago and has gradually been slipping away from her more and more every month. She's now afraid to leave him alone and has to manage everything on her own. She's grown quite depressed and wonders if there's anything she can do to cope more effectively. Welcome to our course on Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. We're going to tackle many difficult questions, but perhaps none more difficult or important than what we can change and what we can't. When should we roll up our sleeves and give it another go? When is it a matter of just applying more elbow grease or a clever new technique or program? And when should we start working on our ability to accept things the way they are? Socrates tells us the unexamined life is not worth living. We're admonished to know thyself. From a very young age, we're told stories about the little engine that could. You can do anything if you set your mind to it, right? Well, sort of. Over the next 24 lectures, we'll repeatedly come back to the question of what we can change and what we can't. But in either case, I hope to show you that there are things you can do to lessen suffering and improve your quality of life. Sometimes that means following a program to genuinely change something about yourself. But many times it will mean learning how to accept, or dare I say even value things about yourself or your world that you simply can't change. My goals are really twofold. First, I hope to present the science of how we change, of how we can improve or even treat ourselves. Second, I want to leave you with a toolbox of practical, evidence-based strategies you can apply on your own whenever you need them. So first, let's talk a bit about the science of change. And to talk about the science, we first have to decide what level of analysis we want. We can talk about the biological, 
We could talk about the psychological, or we could talk about the social. Of course, for the biological, we might talk about medicine, we might talk about neuroscience. For psychology, we might talk about emotions and cognitions. For the social, we might talk about the relationships in our lives, our significant others, our communities, or even societies. We'll talk about psychotherapy research. How do we know what's evidence-based? How do we know what works for what particular problem or disorder? We'll want to look at what level of change we're interested in. Are we trying to change an individual? Are we trying to change a couple? Are we trying to change a family or even a community or a society? Now, whenever we talk about change, it's important that we reflect on our own personal philosophies or ideologies of change. What is your philosophy of mind? Can we change who we are fundamentally? Can we change our cognitions, emotions, and behaviors? Now, CBT has its own ideology, its own preferences. It's very much grounded in Western empiricism, and it really holds up the value of rationality. It holds up the power of the scientific method. Now, it's not saying that emotions or passions are bad or wrong, and we want to push those down. It's really about finding balance. Of course, this tension between rationality and passion or emotion is certainly not new. In fact, the Greek and Stoic philosophers talked about Apollonian versus Dionysian perspectives on life and their theories of mind. Now, for our toolbox, we're going to take a CBT, a cognitive behavioral therapy focus, and we're going to look at the underlying foundational theories in over 30 years of science to tell us what tools work. We're going to present specific sets of tools and skills to facilitate change when change is possible. Now, that theory is going to help us to see the complex interrelationships between cognitions, behaviors, and emotions. And we're going to see if we reach into that complex mix and we change one, we're probably going to change them all. Now, my personal goal is to give CBT away. I want to teach other people how to become their own CBT therapist. Is this a form of self-help? Well, sure it is. Any form of self-improvement is a form of self-help. But there's really no shortcuts, and there's really no magic. This can be quite difficult, and I think it takes practice, and it takes commitment. As you'll learn, one of the key ideas of CBT is that we all view the world through a subjective lens. The same will be true for how you see this course and for how I teach it. My lens comes from clinical psychology, first starting in neuroscience at MIT, then moving to psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was fortunate to learn CBT from Aaron Beck, Rob DeRubis, and Marty Seligman. Now, from there, I made my trek across the country to San Francisco, where I first worked at San Francisco General Hospital. And there I learned a great deal about serious psychopathology, about substance use disorder, and the powerful social determinants of health, especially poverty. I ended up at the University of California in the Division of General Internal Medicine, leading clinical research and educational programs looking at integrated behavioral health in primary care. So we'll be able to bring in a number of different sciences and a number of different levels of practice. Now, the other thing I would like us to do is to break open and examine some ideas about mental health and mental illness. I want you to picture a person with a mental illness. Just in your mind's eye, I want you to give them a shape, a size, give them a gender, give the person a race, what are they wearing? How well-kempt are they? What does that person look like, a person with mental illness? Now I want you to picture a person who's mentally healthy, someone that has good mental health. What does that person look like? And as before, give them a shape, a height, a size, a gender, a race, an appearance. What does a mentally healthy person look like? Now, obviously, in both of those categories, there's a great range of appearances, and there's no one prototype. But I hope you can hold up those two images and see that there's an awful lot of overlap between them. In fact, it might be the same person at different points in their life. So why do we want to do this? Well, I think there's a lot of stigma, and it's important that we remember that mental illness is common. In fact, one in four of us, or 25% of us, will have a diagnosable mental illness at some point in our lives. Just think about the recent news. It's hard to open the paper without reading about school shooters, or post-traumatic stress disorder in combat veterans, or teen suicides, or depression, or burnout, or bullying. We need more attention to mental health, and we need to reduce the stigma of reaching out for help. 
it's important to remember that even though a person has a mental illness, that they could still make an important contribution to society. A couple of examples come to mind. The first is Marsha Linehan, a psychologist and world-renowned researcher who founded a kind of therapy called dialectical behavior therapy, probably the only effective therapy known to help individuals with borderline personality disorder or parasuicidal behavior. How did she come up with the therapy? She struggled with the diagnosis herself. Or a young patient that came to me who was in the proverbial gutter using IV drugs, with HIV AIDS, with depression, and feeling suicidal. He's now the head of a top nursing training program and has founded a number of clinics for homeless health care. We can look at celebrities. What about Betty Ford? What about Buzz Aldrin, Beethoven, Terry Bradshaw, Marlon Brando? And the list goes on and on. Now, I want to share a few caveats. This course is about a psychotherapy, CBT, but it's not psychotherapy itself, and it doesn't take the place of treatment should treatment be needed. We're going to look at mental illness, but this is also about promoting, promoting mental health. Essentially, you get what you put into it. I think of it as very similar. If you decide you want to be more physically fit, you get a gym membership, but you still have to go and you still have to do those exercises. Now, we're going to cover a lot of different topics, but I think of it as sort of a sampler platter approach. You'll get a little taste of what might interest you, and hopefully we'll be able to direct you to websites and to readings should you want to learn more. Now, as we learn about how thoughts and behaviors influence emotions and motivations, you will be having thoughts about thoughts, and you will be having feelings about feelings. This course will trigger ideas, excitement, boredom, agreement, or even outrage. It's all grist for the mill. It's cognition and action. Use it as a real-world CBT opportunity to dig deeper, to understand your response, and to possibly control or change it. Now, let's get back to change. I want you to think of three things that you believe are unchangeable. Any three things that you think about yourself that you can't change. You might have come up with something like, you can't change your race. If you're an adult, you can't change your height or you can't change your sex or your gender. Simple, right? Well, maybe not so simple. What if you were to send off one of those genetics, genetic tests that looks at your racial ancestry? And much to your surprise, you're not entirely the race that you thought you were. Are you the same person? Well, of course, but maybe your perception of your race has changed. What about your height? Well, of course you're full grown when you're an adult, barring any sort of rare diseases, but we also know that individuals shrink as we age. In fact, we lose one to two inches of our height as we grow older. But gender and sex, definitely not changeable. Well, unless you consider sexual reassignment or sexual affirmation surgeries. That line between gender, between male and female, is much more blurred than at any time before. But what if you were to think about things that can absolutely change? Things you know that if you roll up your sleeves and just put in enough effort, you can change them. You might think of things like, well, your social skills. You can change your relationships, or maybe you can change your beliefs. But we know that things like introversion and extroversion are very difficult to change, and they very much affect our capacity to learn and to use social skills. You can certainly end your relationships, but you may recreate the exact same relationship dynamics with another person. In terms of beliefs, just look at how polarized our country is in terms of political beliefs. Are those beliefs changeable? Maybe. It's really not so easy, and it's really not so cut and dry. Change is difficult, but remember that it isn't just an internal, individual process. We also want to look at external factors. And remember that even if you can't change something, you might be able to change the way you think about it or react to it. Now, when we talk about change, what is it that we're changing? We talk about changing our mind all the time, but what does that really mean? Now, at base, we are biological beings, so when we talk about changing ourselves, we're on some level talking about changing our brains, and maybe our bodies too. These individual changes may trigger changes in others or changes in our environment in a complex, bi-directional, iterative system. Now, a helpful model to think about this is called the biopsychosocial model, originally developed by George Engel in the late 1970s. And to understand the biopsychosocial model, you really just need to imagine a Venn diagram with three circles. We have one circle for the biological, one circle for social, and one circle for psychological. Now, some factors may reside in just one circle, some may reside in two circles, 
and some might be right in the center, including biological, psychological, as well as social factors. Now, if we are to think about CBT, the psychological circle obviously comes to mind. We talk about cognitions and emotions, but the social circle might also come to mind as we talk about relationships and we talk about social supports. Now, let's go back to Carol, our young woman who has a problem with social anxiety, or Michael, who's angry, or Maria, who's stressed and depressed. They hope to change behavior and emotions and maybe relationships, presumably by changing their minds and their brains. But how? Well, there's a number of different pathways or mechanisms that might help them to change. There is pharmacotherapy. There are a number of psychoactive agents that can reach in biologically and change an individual's mood, which we know will change cognition and probably change behavior too. There's a limited number of neurosurgeries that would influence the way an individual feels. For example, for severe obsessive compulsive disorder, there is a brain surgery to help those individuals. You might look at psychotherapy, and that's primarily where we're going to focus, and we'll look at CBT, a special type of psychotherapy. There's also self-help, and we'll talk about some CBT tools that you can use on your own. Or there's a spirituality, and we'll talk about third-wave therapies that have a more spiritual component. Now, I would posit that just as our brains can be exercised or trained to improve cognitive function, we can also train our brains to improve motivation, management of emotions, and our interpersonal skills. But what does the research show us? Now, as of 2014, I was able to find 21 studies using brain scans, PET scans, and functional MRIs that looked at whether or not there were changes in brain activation as a consequence of someone engaging in psychotherapy. The psychotherapy most commonly studied in these, in these different research studies was CBT for depression and CBT for anxiety. There was, without question, notable changes in the patterns of activation. I'll mention just one of the earlier studies published in 2004 and published by Gold Apple. This was a study looking at cognitive behavioral therapy versus an antidepressant called Paxil. Now, the patients in both of these groups became much less depressed. In fact, they were considered remitted from their depressive episodes. But when you looked at changes in brain activation, the patterns were different depending on what kind of treatment the individual got. For CBT, there was more hippocampal activation, and for Paxil, there was more prefrontal activation. It's really a very interesting idea to think that at some point in the future that we might not just diagnose mental illness, but we will diagnose dysfunction in patterns of brain activation, and we'll be able to tailor or maybe personalize the kind of psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy an individual would get based on what those deficiencies might be. In a 2008 review done by Fruin, trying to push the field along to, so we can get to that point of personalized psychiatry, she finds that the field is still somewhat murky and contradictory, although the brain effects are clear. The talking cure changes your brain. We just don't have a consistent explanation for how that happens yet. But I want you to think about some of the implications. It tells us that our social interactions, our relationships with each other or with the therapist, have the power to change our brains. Our schools, seminars, trainings, educational videos can facilitate a sort of rewiring as we learn new skills. Let's follow this line of reasoning a bit and think about the implications for psychotherapy. Now, we know that therapy can cause changes in how particular areas of the brain are activated, and this may cause beneficial effects in emotion, behavior, or, or other factors. But does any type of therapy do this? Some would say, yes, absolutely. There are a common set of what they call nonspecific factors that make therapy beneficial. So this would be things like the therapeutic alliance, uh, empathy, or providing what's called a corrective emotional experience. But in this course, we'll suggest that CBT goes above and beyond that. You get those specific factors, but you also get new mood management and life skills. And sure, medications can also cause changes in brain activation, but we should remember that we don't have to intervene on that level unless we choose to do so. In fact, I think of the analogy of the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now, with cardiovascular disease, we can use diet, exercise, and nutrition, or we can use pharmacotherapy such as statins for cholesterol, or you can choose to combine them. The choice is really yours, and it's partly dependent on where you are in terms of risk or in terms of severity. Now, we believe that change of some sort is always possible regardless of our age or background. 
but it might not be the change you are expecting. Learning how to assess your situation and select an appropriate tool is a vital skill. As Charles Darwin tells us, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So let's start laying the foundation of our toolbox of change. We're going to take a look at our first therapy vignette. Here you will see Carol, the 30-year-old woman with social anxiety disorder, and she's learning the basics of, the CB of CBT and the CBT triangle. Okay, so what I wanted to do is a, a little bit more of teaching the foundations of cognitive behavioral therapy. And why don't you tell me from just the, the limited experience you've had so far, how is it that cognitive behavior therapy works? Or why do they even call it cognitive behavior therapy? I don't know. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so it, it's called uh, cognitive behavioral. Okay, clearly no artistic skill in coming up with this name. Cognitive behavioral therapy because it's about cognitions and it's about behaviors. Cognitions are just all the mental activity that we have. Thoughts, beliefs, values, priorities, uh, images, memories, all the mental activity. And behaviors are really things you do by yourself, things you do at work, things you do at home. They can be social, they can be alone. So it, they're both fairly big buckets. And we believe it works because of something called the CBT triangle. And CBT is just cognitive behavioral therapy. So up at the top of the triangle, we have thoughts. So when you're in a social situation, I would guess that you have certain thoughts that come to mind, and we'll get to those in, in just a minute. Um, but there are also behaviors, and those behaviors might be avoidance behavior. So staying at home and just spending time with your cats is a behavior, um, but going out, going to work is a behavior as well. And any guess what that third corner might be on that triangle? Feelings, emotions. Exactly, exactly. So emotions or, or feelings are down here. And they draw it as a triangle because all of these are really arrows. They're, one is connected to the other. So what that means simply is the way you think affects the behavioral choices that you make. The way you think affects the emotions that you have. But it works the other direction too. So if you start off feeling fairly anxious, that's an emotion, you will have more anxious thoughts. So the way you feel affects the way you think. The way you feel is going to affect your behavioral choices. You can also flip it the other way with behaviors. If you decide that you're going to call your sister, that's a behavior, that might influence your mood. You might have a great conversation and you feel better afterwards. It might influence the thoughts. So you might be talking about something that happened a few years ago and you start having thoughts about it. So all of these are interconnected. Now that's good news because, you know, it's really hard to reach in and change emotions it's less hard to reach in and capture a thought or record a behavior and then try to make some changes. So if these emotions are getting in the way of what you want in life, and for you it's anxiety, we have two opportunities with behaviors and with thoughts to do something about it. So cognitive behavioral therapy, we reach in, we want to capture the thoughts first and then decide if we can change them. Because if we change them, it's going to change emotion. If we reach in behaviors, we're going to capture them first. We're going to try to change them. If we change them, we might change emotions as well. So it gives us two pathways, really, to try to change how a person's feeling. So as we continue through the course, we will continue looking at case vignettes. We will continue education about cognitive behavioral therapy. We've just now started at the beginning, really at the surface, the initial teaching about CBT, but you'll see from the top, we'll proceed down towards deeper, more complex cognitive structures and more complex levels of behavioral analysis. I think, though, as we learn about CBT, it's important to keep in mind what I see as some of the special features of CBT in comparison to other kinds of psychotherapy. First, CBT is collaborative and transparent. And by collaborative, I mean that the patient and the therapist join together in a partnership. They roll up their sleeves together, begin collecting data on the problem from the individual's real-world situations. They create a formulation, and then they develop a treatment plan together. It's all done together as a team. 
it's transparent because all of those steps and the rationale for all of those steps is made explicit. There's no magic happening behind the screen. It's all above board. It's all on the table. Remember our goal as a CBT therapist is to teach a patient to be his or her own CBT therapist. So you need to know how it works and why we did the things that we did for your treatment plan. The second is that CBT is empirical. And here I don't just mean psychotherapy research and evidence about whether or not it works. They have coined a term called collaborative empiricism. Now we've talked about the collaborative part, but the empirical part is that we'll come up with a hypothesis, an idea of what makes Michael angry or what makes Maria depressed or what makes Carol socially anxious, but it's only a hypothesis. We then have to test out that hypothesis in the real world usually by giving homework assignments. So the patient will have their hypothesis, they'll have their homework assignment, then go out to test it out to see if it works. If it works, great, we'll go to the next step. But if it doesn't work, again, it's grist for the mill. We'll roll up our sleeves, we'll figure out what happened, and we'll come up with the next hypothesis or the next homework assignment. The next feature is that CBT is time limited. There is an endpoint. Now it varies depending on the individual, sometimes on the insurance company, but it usually ranges from between 12 to say 24 sessions, depending again on resources, severity, and what the treatment goals might be. It is skills focused. Again, no magic behind the curtain. We're gonna teach an individual skills that they can practice in the real world come back and talk about obstacles or challenges. They will hone those skills and continue practicing until they feel that they have mastered those skills. It's also symptom focused. So there's oftentimes a, num um, a number of different symptom measures for depression, for anxiety, for positive emotion, for whatever the issue might be. We'll wanna get a baseline, but then we'll want to reassess that individual over time as they're using those skills to see if those scores, those symptoms are improving. CBT is also focused on the present. So we won't sit someone down and say, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about your relationship with your parents. We might get to that point if it's relevant to treatment, but we're gonna start with where you are now, how you feel now, and what's happening in your life right now that brought you into treatment. We're gonna start from the top and we're gonna work our way down. We start with the CBT triangle, we start with conceptualizations or formulations of everyday events, and then we start working our way deeper to understand the individual's personality and maybe their relationship dynamics. Now, I do wanna say, even though there's this focus on empiricism and on evidence and on hypothesis testing, all of this language and words used in science, it doesn't mean that we don't value the therapeutic relationship. In fact, that connection is crucial. If you're going to go through the difficult work of tackling these problems that you may have been working with for years with limited success, you're going to need a partner that you feel very safe with, that you trust, that you know is absolutely 100% on your side. So where we'll go next with Carol is to have her start collecting data on herself, on the building blocks of behavior and cognitions by doing something called self-monitoring. Now this can be done in a sort of diary or journal, or you can use a structured checklist that gives you examples of different activities or social contacts or cognitions. Now if you're interested in those checklists, I would recommend three that were developed by Ricardo Munoz, the chief psychologist at San Francisco General Hospital and now an emeritus professor at UCSF. If you're interested in finding those instruments, I would encourage you to use our friend Google. You just need to type in Ricardo Munoz, CBT and manual, you'll see that there are two manuals that pop up, one published by the RAND Corporation for a study he did in collaboration with them, and the other linked to San Francisco General Hospital and UCSF, both available freely for download. So if you wanted to give yourself some homework, you might want to review the clip about the triangle. You might wanna draw your own triangle in a therapy journal. You might wanna think about examples from your own life about activating events and what were the emotions, what were the cognitions, what were the behaviors, or you might wanna use those checklists that you've downloaded from the web. So next I wanted to introduce a new feature in this particular lecture series, something we call the FAQs or the frequently asked questions. Now oftentimes when I work with patients or when I teach CBT to learners, they are able to engage with me by asking a number of common questions that come up. You're not able to do that, but what we did in advance 
was to elicit questions from learners and from patients, and we're going to be sharing those questions, and I'm going to be answering those questions as we move forward. So here's our first FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. It sounds as though CBT is telling me not to follow my gut. It's telling me not to trust my feelings or my instincts. Is that right? And how can that be? Well, this is a common question, and I think a really important one. And I think it gets us back to that tension between rationality and emotion. And remember that CBT, even though it's very much grounded on a rational examination of how a person's thinking, making decisions, or running their life or relationships, it's not just about rationality, it's about balance. We realize that every yin needs a yang. We need our passion and emotions, but sometimes when things are unbalanced, people start to experience a lot of emotional suffering, then it's time to raise up those rationality skills or those CBT skills. I think as we move forward, too, you'll see that there's a number of widely different tools that fit into the CBT toolbox. Some of them are very much focused on rationality, rolling up your sleeves and wrestling with thoughts. Some of them, not so much. It's more about reaching out and connecting with friends and having that emotional richness and connection that isn't so much about rationality. FAQ number two, why did you become a CBT therapist instead of some other kind of therapist, like a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist? And a good question, and I won't pretend that this was my master plan and I'm exactly where I thought I would be. I'm surprised where I am, but happy to be here. I actually started in the neurosciences at MIT. And in the summer, when I was working in a job at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, I was at my wet bench lab, and I was mapping the neural pathways between the auditory nerve and the superior olive in the brainstem. But in this same lab, they were developing cochlear implants, so patients and families would come in. And what really lit the fire in my belly wasn't the neural mapping, that was interesting, but it was listening to the family's stories, their beliefs, their emotions, their hopes and their expectations. And I thought, that, that is what I want to do. So with a lot of advice, and a lot of help from terrific mentors, I decided to go to the route of psychology. I ended up at the University of Pennsylvania, which is known for its training in cognitive behavioral therapy, and I was fortunate then to become a cognitive behavioral therapist. The third FAQ, the CBT triangle makes sense, but it seems too simple. People and relationships are more complicated. How can something so simplistic be effective? Now, I encourage you to remember we're just getting started. We started at the top, and the CBT triangle is really sort of the first paragraph of the first chapter. So I ask you just to buckle your seatbelt, to join us on this journey, and follow us as we move to progressively more complex layers of analysis, helping us to understand the relationships between cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. So in our next lecture, we're going to turn again to our clinical cases. We'll talk about how we assess these individuals, how we begin collecting and collating these data, these data and setting our SMART goals. Thank you.